Welcome to the Lights Out Podcast. This is Chris Lights Out Lytle, and this is our journey to document the history of mixed martial arts. I have brought with me my friend, the MMA detective Mike Davis, and together we will preserve the history and hear some great stories from the world in the era of the no-holds bar. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back to the Lights Out MMA History Podcast. I am Joey Venti. I'm with the host of the show, the MMA detective Mike Davis. Our guest today is a true pioneer of the sport who fought in the no holes bullet guard era. He's a champion of a one-day Super Brawl heavyweight tournament, as well as a veteran of the International Valley Tudo Championships and the UFC. He had a wild career, which included some very big names. We are excited to catch up with Bob Gilstrap. Bob, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. So, Bob Gilstrap, first off, ladies and gentlemen, we're doing this at an hour for Bob's children or mine are going to be prevalent in the background. Let's just uh, apologize ahead of time. The only one that's got his house in order is Joey. That's oh, I got, a, I got a four to five-year-old running around out there. Hopefully they stay out there. <laughs> right, right. In that out, out there. Right, yeah, right. right. So they're in the house. <laughs> so, Bob, obviously UFC 17 was uh, when the country first learned of you. But let's start from the beginning. Um, where did your beginnings in mixed martial arts start? Uh, all right. So I guess my story is uh, I kind of grew up a short, little, fat, funny kid. I uh, got picked on a lot. Uh, that kind of stuff kind of had the old uh, like man crush on Bruce Lee. I'm like, no one picks on Bruce Lee. Not man crush, but, you know, just, yeah, oh, the, that's the tough guy, you know. And, and, uh, um, went through high school uh my junior senior year let's put it in perspective uh from the fifth grade to through my professional career i weighed uh 220 pounds uh, i just wasn't as tall as that in the fifth grade so i was a short little chunky kid and then it kind of my junior year grew into it um after high school i got into uh, uh taekwondo and some other stuff to to pursue martial arts, kind of, you know, red Jeet Kune Do, went through the Bruce Lee stuff as much as I could, um, did not fare well in a uh, point system martial art type uh, venue uh, because it comes, that's where I first was uh, uh, introduced to like physics, you know, smaller guys are faster. That's all there is to it. Uh, they're they're going to hit you more times. They're going to hit you faster. Um, I just hit harder. So I left uh, point stuff, uh, started looking for uh, some full contact, uh, was turned away from a couple of boxing gyms, uh, found Maurice Smith, and uh, and that's where it started. So well, that's a hell of a starting line, Maurice Smith. <laughs> yeah, it really is. So was this Maurice Smith at the time of the Alliance or a – pre-alliance Maurice Smith this was a pre-alliance Maurice Smith this was uh this was pre-UFC Maurice Smith oh um, yeah there there was no there wasn't even a UFC created yet now of course um fighting has been in the top three sports outside of the United States for millennia uh it's just here in America we didn't talk about it really until about 2006 until Dana put it on spike. You know what I mean? Joey, I, I think you will agree with me. Like we caught the, like the three of us. I mean, we all yeah. caught the MMA bug really, really early. Real early. Absolutely. Yeah. And when going to a party with friends and family, were you ever asked by like parents not to talk about MMA because it was just such a, like a topic that was pretty heavy and people would be like, what is going on here? No, I, uh, I come from a pretty ignorant family. And so <laughs> when, uh, you know, kind of rednecky, uh, uh, you know, our, our, our family tree is, is straight up and down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, so when I'd get to talking about MMA, I'd get a lot of, Oh, you mean WWF? Oh, you mean wrestling? And I'm like, no, we do it for real. They're like, oh, you mean WWE? And I'm not taking anything from those athletes because those guys, they take a beating. But uh, it, they're, it's prearranged versus ours. We're all trying to be the winner. Well, well Joey, like, and to, to add to that, they would say, 
Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like real. Like, yeah, 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 yeah real. Oh, oh. Yeah. Real. Yeah, like, real. Joey, Joey, yeah. Joey, did you get that as well? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. In the like early, early dark days, yeah. People didn't believe it was real. Yeah. And it's like, oh, it's not scripted. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, you know? you're, you're keeping a secret. You know, you're keeping yeah. the industry secrets. Yeah, we're marks. Um, so, Bob, the one thing that your era of NHB, your first fight's in 1997. But the one thing that I, like, you're part of the generation, like the headbutt generation, as well as the generation that paid to fight or fought for free. Right. And that is a a hard road to travel. Right. We didn't have- and go ahead. There's, there's a certain type of individual that like I've come to realize that um, would pay to fight and generally they're, and I'm not saying this applies to you, but the home life growing up is pretty tumultuous. Like it's pretty, yeah. there's a lot of waves. I mean, even, even when I had my gym jump forward 20 years later, you know, uh, you're, 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 you're giving rich kids, rich, happy kids don't get into MMA unless you're BJ Penn. You know what I mean? Like if BJ comes from good money, you know, uh, but most, most people are, are looking for a way out. They're looking for a vacation. They're looking somewhere to channel their negativity. You know, um, uh, the kids that came to my gym, uh, again, they're, they're looking for an opportunity. You know, they see these limelight guys uh mcgregor's and stuff like that on on the ufc and and talked about but until recently we didn't make any money and they don't get it man when you're going out in these even even today you're lucky to get 300 to show and 300 to win like it might cover your expenses to get there or something well when i try to describe this like accurately to people so they can wrap their head around it i said would Sean Strickland fight for free? And they say, oh, yeah. Would Sean Strickland pay <laughs> to fight? Oh, for sure. Now imagine an entire event, you know, maybe not with his skills or athleticism, but that type of personality right. was the entire locker room. Right, right. And and we, we uh, like, again, I came, and we'll probably get into this, I came out of retirement. Uh, because I had a gym going and my students kind of talked me into it. Uh, not a great idea. F- uh, fight at 39, 40, and 41. Uh, didn't win one of those. Uh, <laughs> it's a young, it's a younger guy's sport, man. But uh, you know, the, the leading killer over men over 40 is their ego. So uh, the um, uh, truth, uh, it's not truth to that. It's not yeah. truth. <laughs> right, right. So um, it just, just, these kids are softer now. I mean, like even my students would complain. They'd want to like Facebook stalk these guys or look them up. You know, we didn't have those options. You know, people, people get on me about not having all my fights on, 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 on uh, the computer, you know, well, I, I used to have to lug around my own VHS recorder and put it on a tripod and talk somebody into, into videotaping my fights, you know, um, and, and these kids will stalk people and, oh, I don't want to fight that guy back in my day. You know, my coach would come to me and go, Hey, you ready to fight? Doesn't matter who's across the ring. Um, we were just all tougher back there. And the pioneers, the guys I fought up in Canada, you know, uh, uh, Jason, all those guys, you know, um, great dudes. They, they didn't make it as far as I did, but they didn't get the recognition. Um, but you know, we were all just tough, tough kids. You guys not only not only did you not have a, an avenue to fortune, but there really wasn't an avenue to fame either. Like UFC 17, they weren't selling a ton of pay-per-views. No. No. And and there wasn't there wasn't it wasn't it, again, it was it was a uh, a legal way for us to vent our traumatic childhoods out in an athletic manner. You know what I mean? I uh, I guess. I I mean every everyone's got their own reasons, but Beats going to yeah. jail, I guess. And yeah. Beats going to jail. And, and, and you know, like uh, that, the type of mentality also was, well, if I'm in the gym and fighting like on all of the weekends, it keeps me like out of trouble, keeps my lady off my back and money out outside of the bar and still in my pocket. So right. it, it, it was just a very unique time. So January 11th, 1997, United Full Contact 
Federation. That's Matt Hume's organization, I believe. Yep. Your first opponent. Your first opponent is Chris Munson. Were you still with Maurice Smith at this time, or had your training room product? Um. Yeah. So we were. I was. So we all started in the same gym. We all started. Matt Hume was the very first person that ever showed me any kind of grappling, and he showed Maurice as well. Uh, Maurice and Haru had uh, uh, AMC kickboxing there in Kirkland, Washington, and uh, later. Uh, uh we we you know all through the amateurs and stuff we were all together and then we split due to management reasons uh i followed maurice and matt hume's fighters were next you know pretty much our rivalry um and chris munson was first on deck in in that lineup so yeah we had so, so chris yeah, Chris Munson was fighting with Charlie Pearson at this time, I believe. Am I correct? Oh, yeah, you're correct. You're correct. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Another legendary trainer still around. Um, ton of history. You know what? He, Joey, we got to get him on. Charlie Pearson is, is somebody we absolutely should concentrate on getting on here. So, Chris Munson, it's your first fight. Bring us through it, dude. This is the era of the headbutt. So, it's a different type of athlete entering into these things. Yeah, it was um, it was my opportunity to go out and use everything that I had been taught in a malicious manner. Um, and and, uh, uh, you know, because you don't you don't you don't let go in practice like that. You don't you you're not looking for the win. Well, in practice, you're looking for the sub, but you're not looking to hurt anybody. Uh, MMA. Uh, just gave me an opportunity to just unleash the, all the years of bullshit I had stored up in my pocket. So uh, Munson got the abuse of that. And I think there was some headbutts in there, but I just went out and kind of let everything go. Most of my, I am, I am one of the worst wrestlers on the planet. Uh, I have no takedown defense. <laughs> so there's my secret. Um, and not so much of a secret. I love the stand and bang though. Uh, I love trading that though, with people. And then once we get to the ground, which most people would get me to the ground, uh, I felt pretty comfortable once we were down there. I just didn't have the good knees. Um, so me and Munson ended up on the ground and uh, I can't remember everything. I think we rolled around a little bit. I think I ended up on top and threw some stuff and uh, went into the next round. And Mun I don't, Munson was a great athlete and he was super strong. Big, um, big guy, huge guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I don't think he. Most of the guys that I fought didn't like my power. Once I started unloading punches, that that was what gave me my competitive edge. Okay, I, you. I think. Yeah. So you mentioned Matt Hume being the first person to actually show you what submissions are. Where did Matt Hume? Where do you surmise Matt Hume Hume's like information in regards to submissions came from at this point? I, to me, it was just, it was guessing. I don't, we never really, uh, he, cause he came on as a coach at a coach level. So him, him and Maurice and management would talk about that kind of stuff. I was just, I was just, honestly, I was the only kid big enough in, uh, the, the school that Maurice could beat up on Matt could beat up on. And another one of my buddies, John Renfro could beat up on. And, and not complain. So I was their dummy. I, I pretty much just laid there and let Matt would show how to throw the stuff. Then Mo would go. Cause you know, again, it was te all about teaching Mo and John was just a really big, you know, muscle guy and, and, you know, heavyweight as well. So another training partner for Mo. So it was all about uh, Matt spreading his knowledge to Maurice. And, and I was just lucky enough to be in the right spot at the right time. But uh, Matt had 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 experience from, pancreas I, I think he was over in japan i don't know for how long he was over in japan um i met matt actually years a year or two before that a uh, little known secret about matt matt used to be a cobbler he he worked in the fred meyer uh working on shoes and i and i ran an espresso bar in a fred meyer so this was before amc before all that um so going way back yeah, Matt's, Matt's one of those guys. I ran into him in Colorado, uh -huh. and 
there's like a short list of people that I would 100% come across as a fanboy douchebag to. And <laughs> Matt is probably at the top of that list, but I controlled myself and just a- asked a couple dorky questions. Like it was just a, you know, happenstance. Right. And then went on my way, never got a picture, which I've always wanted. You know, right. nor did I ask him for his phone number for an interview. So yeah, right. it was in Denver, Colorado when one FC was out there. So yeah. Matt I, is I an amazing, well. good yeah, thing. Matt is amazing <laughs> coach, amazing person. Um, I, I just got caught up in a rivalry between two gyms uh, that I didn't start. So well, was, that, that, that's what makes good fights. I mean, let's dude, call it, it what it is. Well, I mean, even, even to this day, my, I mean, and, and meeting people outside of the fight industry, they don't know how to take us. Cause like I pretty much all my best friends and, and including myself, like we've all punched each other in the face and people are like, huh? Like I, I don't have a good friend that I haven't punched in the face. You know what I mean? Or, or that has punched me in the face. <laughs> so it's transpired. Yeah. yeah on some, the front lawn, in a bar, house yeah, party. Some, Something yeah. <laughs> has happened at some point somewhere and we're good with that. You know what I mean? That's why I love <laughs> fighters. Fighters are the most upfront, honest people you ever meet. Cause what's the, what's the outcome of a negative conversation, an argument? Where's that lead a fight? Yeah. Fuck that's practice. <laughs> right. So the Pacific Northwest at this time, like, and, and Joey's a California guy. I'm a Midwest guy, but like, if you were to like pinpoint, just hotbeds where incredible athletes came from the Pacific Northwest based on, you know, this sparse population wouldn't be one of those places, but the athlete that came out of there, Dennis Hallman, Benji Raddick, Ivan Salivary, Matt Hume, Josh Barnett, like the list goes on and on and on where it's uh, Landon Showalter. I mean, that's just right. off the top of my head. Yeah. The amount of athlete coming out of there, it's shocking just how far like that, that little scene right there, just, just like, I, I guess how up on the food chain that they actually were. Right. Between, between Matt Hume, Marie Smith and up North Charlie Pearson and us, us three gyms competing against each other, honing skills and going up into Canada and all the Canadians beating on us or taking a lick and, uh, we we were like the underrated in my opinion back then they were very much underrated state that because uh we, a lot of a lot of talent came out of washington state. And, and and keep in mind that's just washington i mean yeah. oregon also falls oh, yeah. into well, that quarter well, well, quest yeah. and i have not mentioned a single member of raw or team quest right think about right. that that's yeah. the pacific northwest yeah yeah so your first airplane ride, which, I mean, this is one of those benchmarks that you have to have. April 9th, 1997, a legendary tournament in Super Brawl 4. So Super Brawl 4 was headlined by Danny Boy Bennett and J.R. Palmer, which J.R. Palmer is on like, caught like a 14th fight win streak. They brought you and Danny Boy Bennett up there as just cannon fodder because no one would fight J.R. Well, yes, it was, uh, again, I think Matt had ties to Hawaii. Um, but so I got invited over for three actually where my, butt and I cornered my buddy, John Renfro, who, uh, lost to, um, Pete, uh, I'm Williams. Blank as, yep. Pete thank Williams. you. Thank you, Jerry. And then, uh, Real quick, like, and we were over there, and that's that's the first time Danny Boy knocked out Jr. Palm. Um, so it was at three, and that was the legendary head kick around the world. One of the best, if you haven't seen it, one of the best head kicks you'll ever see. Uh, Danny Boy's interview afterwards, like, I thought I killed him. I mean, the dude looked dead. I mean, from the moment the 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 shin uh, touched his chin, the way he fell, the way he fell out of the ring, um, he didn't wake up for a while. I mean, it, it was amazing. And that started that. And then four, I got invited over. So it was my turn to compete, um, which was cool. Uh, and so I was in the heavyweight bracket. Danny Boy had the rematch against J.R. Palmer. And Leonard Carter, who was out of uh, Danny Boy's gym, and again, another cross-trained partner of ours, uh, had the middleweight bracket. Wait, 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 and- r- r- real quick. 
the rematch with Danny Boy Bennett because J.R. Palmer was just, I mean, it was a fluke what took place there. Oh, yeah. What, what happened in the rematch? The exact fucking same thing. <laughs> it was the exact same thing in the same style of knockout. And okay, the me, same thing. Yeah, okay. It, 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 just, it wasn't as yeah, it wasn't as a cool the way he fa- passed our went down the second time, but same shit, different day. Right. Beautiful. So so just just so kind of everybody understands, like Mad Hume is an evil genius. Like yeah. he is somebody that can kind of look at a style and just go, all right, let me get you, let me get you a two and seven guy. Don't worry. <laughs> this guy, he's just going to come in, you know, as your body. And that two and seven guy will match up in a way where it'll beat like that hometown person. This right. was kind of Matt Hume's, I think, knocking on the door of being able to consistently do that. So you right. just kind of, you know, got to sit back and just avoid Matt Hume altogether if uh, he's going to be matchmaker <laughs> filling right? spots for your hometown guys. Right. So talk yeah, about Super sure. Brawl 4, absolute legendary tournament. Um, you start with uh, John Matua and Lance Gibson. Those are your two opponents, four-man yeah. tournament. Uh, four-man tournament. So uh, at weigh-ins, uh, well, I – so Maurice, my coach, uh, was – held up with a fight of his own. So I flew out there with Matt Hume and Lance Gibson and me and Lance were in the same bracket. So that was awkward. There was tension there. Um, I hadn't seen Matt in quite some time. So me and Matt were kind of talking, but you know, Lance was his fighter. So we get over there and we kind of had to hang out and that's a whole story in itself prepping up to, uh, to the fight. But once we got to the fight, um, you know, Maurice had shown back up. Um, we get to weigh-ins. Uh, John Matua's flight didn't come in. So uh, all I knew about John Matua was his weight. Um, and I was scared to death. I thought he was looking like a bigger version of Chris Munson or, you know, uh, or Jeff Munson, sorry. Um, and then uh, when I finally got to see John Matua, that was when we both came out to the ring. And so he wasn't built the way I thought. And uh, I was immediately going, okay, I, I got to choke this big guy. Um, so we started out there and I thought, you know, hey, he's huge. He's going to have a lot of power. The one gift I think I had in all my training camps and why Maurice later created the Alliance uh, and the Shamrocks and so much talent came to Maurice Smith to learn how to stand up and fight was – no one in any fight ever hit me harder than Mo did in practice. You know, I, I was, I was just conditioned. I mean, unless you've got a, a lucky, you know, my later career, my neck wasn't all there. So I, I got some knockouts, but I mean, very, very seldom could anybody bring something to me that Mo hadn't already hit me with. So once I started exchanging with Matua, uh, I got real comfortable. He wrapped me up. Uh, we, I don't know what he was necessarily trying to do, but then we fell to the ground. Um, I luckily got on top um, and uh, went for some strikes. Yeah, he we got caught up in the K or in the in the ring, I think, because back then th- we didn't really have cages. I mean, a- MMA was just starting, and the only cage out there was the the USC. Um, everybody else, we all fought in in, in rings um boxing rings and then uh then we got to our feet uh again i think or we stayed around on the ground for a little bit and i ended up getting matua with an arm bar uh which Came worked out bar. yep yeah yeah which worked out really good and then um now but man what well, well, here guy. here how about dealing with an adrenaline dump and getting ready to go into that second fight with fearless Lance Gibson. That's the worst freaking thing ever, ever, ever at that point in my career. I mean, it, because, okay, so we got to back up a little bit. So I was not sharing a, a, a back room with Danny boy and Leonard who were sharing a, 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 a corner with Lance. Okay. Cause they were more tied in with Matt. Um, and so I was sharing a ring and I don't remember his name, probably the biggest Japanese dude or biggest Chinese guy. I mean, he was just yoked, whatever. 
Uh, Joey, you remember that guy's name? But anyway, uh, Lance Gibson fought this dude. And this guy was so rocked up. And they did the whole 30 minutes of the round. And, and that guy came back. And this was, granted, this is my first big event. I'd flown somewhere. I'm preparing to fight. This is out of my backyard now. This is out of the Pacific Northwest, out of my comfort zone. And the guy I'm sharing a, a back court room with comes back after his fight looking like a different person. His face had more dots and more lumps than his body did. And that dude had the swole Greek god body. So, I mean, I was like, wow, fuck this. And then so I go out and I do my fight and it goes pretty well. And I come out pretty unscathed. And then I go back to the room and, they, you know, they've got that. There's only one bench or one table, you know, uh, uh, there's some places to sit, but it's like just one like massage table or doctor's table, if you will. And they're all checking this guy out, this, that and the other and doctoring him up because he's pretty beat up. And I came back after uh, uh, Matua and I told Mo, I go, look, dude, I got to fight again later. That guy's done. Like, get that guy out of here. So, of course, Maurice, big brother, he is, goes over and tells those guys to clear out so I can go up there and lay on that table and rest before the next fight. So um, just prepping. I got real lucky. I didn't expend a lot of energy on John. Um, John, if I could characterize anybody as a Marvel character, he's kind of like the beast, just a big guy and super smart. Once after the fight, that was my favorite part about fighting. When I'd win, I'd be the guy out there buying beers because I had more money and I'd just sit there and get to talk to these guys like you've known each other for years. And John Matua was a really nice guy. So getting ready for the next fight, I, uh, I, I was anxious, but I was, I was calm because again, I didn't take a lot of damage at all. So um, I just, I was a little nervy because no one, I was, I didn't know who I was going up against. I mean, like I said earlier about having my gym, my students would Facebook stalk these one opponents. We didn't know who we were fighting. We, we couldn't look them up and we had to fight more than one guy in the same night. So it, it, uh, I feel we were more at that gladiator stage age than, than, uh, they are now, but, I, the the boxing commission got in, lightened it up. I mean, it's it, it's more it's more sporty now, so that's that's good. People can, I guess, maybe fight longer. I don't know. I don't know why, but um, Ed, so did, in Hawaii, did you get a chance to hang out at all, or was it just were you guys just there and gone? Pretty much. So here's my story. I love to tell about that kind of shit. When you fly into anywhere. And they pick you up with press, with limos. You're a big thing, you know, pretty girls, this and that. And then after you fight, the next day you wake up in some seedy hotel room. You got to find your own cab way on the way back. So to the airport, you know, if if you're lucky to even have a flight home. Um. So yeah, it it uh, they they treated us well. It was good, but. Sorry, what was the yeah? Say again. So, no. so you flew okay. back. So you flew back the next day. You didn't get to enjoy Hawaii. Yeah, we got a day. I mean, maybe a uh, like that was. So I got to see more when I went over there the year before with John Renfro than I did when I got to go over there and fight. Uh, and and Maurice was in my corner. Uh, me and Mo Mo was a lot more he'd stick us on the training path i mean maurice never smoked drink nothing maurice smith is just straight as an arrow so he just keep you right on the path all the time hit all your press conferences hit all your appointments you know and then traveling with him as well he's getting drawn in sort of several different directions while he's your coach you know he he's got his interviews and his stuff to do so um we didn't get a whole lot of chance to get around uh the second time we were there you had mentioned obviously a close relationship with Maury Smith. Were you there when he fought Mark Coleman? Yes. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, yeah. So that Were was in his corner. Were you in his uh, corner? No, believe it or not. Out of the however many years me and Maurice were together, uh, I never got to be in his corner. He and I fought at the same time often. So actually, my first uh, big win was or. Who did I fight? 
uh, I fought Jason Farron up in Canada, came back with a black eye, and Mo had come back from fighting Mark Coleman with the opposite black guy. So we were, I met him at the airport, and he couldn't corner me that time because he was at the UFC while I was up fighting in Canada. Okay, okay. Well, you're also Josh Barnett's first opponent. Yeah, that was another one of those Matt Hume setups. Yeah, July seventh, <laughs> nineteen. Yeah, July seventh, nineteen ninety seven. You got Josh Barnett. Um, did you ever work out with Josh prior to this? Were you guys in the same room with each other? We, uh, Josh started with AMC right about the time we split. So okay. there, there was some maybe some very very brief things in the in the very beginning, but at that point. I was quote unquote somebody at AMC finally and Josh wasn't. So we didn't even go in the same training circles, if you will. Josh was an up and comer. But had I known then, uh, what I know, Josh turned into one of the top dudes on the freaking planet. Killer. You know? Yeah. 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 Straight killer. Yep. Yep. So for- I, I got a question about this fight. Uh, I watched it last night. Did you guys fight under Pancrase rules with rope escapes? At one point, you guys were down in the corner. I, it, it was on a home video, so I, I couldn't hear a commentator. But did you guys fight with rope escapes? Um, so the a lot of times the 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 that was the rule. If someone got too far out of the rope, that they would get stand up. Other fights, sometimes people would start using that to their advantage, which I did uh, once exactly up in in Canada. (laughs) Um, And uh, but in the pancreas rules, Matt didn't like that. So unless you were hanging out of the cage or off of the cage, he'd kind of let you fight into the ropes. Does that make well, sense? I mean, what, yeah. Well, what I what I meant was in Pancras, if somebody has a submission hold on you, you grab the rope, they would stand you up. That's not what it looked like happened. Was it shooter? Oh, right. Was it shooter rules? Yeah. So uh, Matt oh, did shooter rules. Do that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so shooter rules also has that rope escape as well. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So they they didn't. Um, I think in the beginning they gave us that kind of option, but no one really wanted to. I can't remember if I ever pulled that. Yeah. So, I mean, I meant like as far as scooting under the ropes. I'm sorry. Right. I misunderstood. Oh, no. It's okay. okay. And yep. you, you take you take Josh Burnett to a decision, which is like in itself an incredible feat. Uh, okay. So, that was when we met. We were both still amateurs. And that was no punching, uh, only slaps to the head, punches to the body. Um, and, and so, or was that, it could have been, I'm not sure if that was pro. Um, you guys were definitely amateur. punching. You guys were definitely punching in this one. Yeah. Okay. And, it, it, and, and, you know, and, and so you can kind of put the time frame together. Um, a few, we met three, twice. We, yeah. We met twice. Did. Yeah. The, the first time I, I can't remember, I don't think we were punching to the face. Uh, I, I think that was specifically like just slapping to the face and punching to the body, kind of like pancreas. And then we had to wear shin guards. And, right. Yeah. And then uh, during, and so that was the, because we were in the shin guards, I don't even know if they counted that as pro, but they could have. Um, and uh, that was right after my grandma had passed away. I hadn't been training for a while, but I kept, I, I stayed on, I, I kept the fight. Um, my whole plan was going there and kick him and knock him out with a head kick. And if you watch the fight, that's all I was trying to do is throw head kicks. And what Barnett do? He just in Barnett style just took me down every time. You know what I mean? And uh, so uh, I, I I pretty much set myself up for failure on that one. Um, again, it was it was I felt when when quote unquote Pancras was coming out in the Pacific Northwest. Matt was pretty much putting the rules together and doing all this. And after my first couple of striking encounters with uh, uh, some of his uh, fighters, the rules seemed to change a little bit and take away one of my best weapons, which was my fist and, and turn it into slaps and then kicks, you know? Um, And that was the, the second time I met Barnett, uh, I ended up getting DQ'd because uh, I was late to, and I got to the fighters meeting. It was after I'd fought in Brazil. Uh, I was feeling all cocky. 
I walked into the Pirates fighters meeting. I go, I got one question. Can I punch? They said, yes. I said, fine. I walked out. Well, apparently you could not close fist punch from the ground. Uh, so that was the DQ. So again, we go out a uh, second time with Barnett. I try to exchange. Barnett takes me down real quick. Barnett's phenomenal on the ground. That guy's so big and, and, and smooth with it all. And, uh, I, I wrapped him up in the guard and I just started lighting him up from my guard. Um, he sat up, uh, like kind of, and looked over at Matt Hume. Matt Hume was looking at him. Um, the ref wasn't doing anything. Uh, I looked at Maurice. Maurice was yelling, hit him again. So I pulled him in with my legs and hit him again. Then the ref stopped it and I was DQ'd. Found out later I couldn't close, closed fish punch from the ground. So it was one okay. of those things where I felt, uh, again, taking away my strikes was was not the best thing. Hey, you know, the, the thing is, at this time, the state's getting involved and in shutting shows down. Yeah. So in order to kind of tap dance around their rules, as well as, you know, get your guys some fights and experience, oftentimes you had to resort to open fist on the ground. Right. Well, and, and knowing all that now it makes total sense. But back then it was, yeah, I took it as a personal, Oh, you know, he's just trying to take away my, you know, this, yeah. that, and the other. Yeah. 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 yeah of course. You well, know, Cause when you're young, you know, everything. So on July 26, 1997, we, it's an event that's called rock combat in our interview with Lee Remedios. He says it's a closed door biker event invite only. And you're fighting Jason Farron. Um, and I mean, it, when, when you walk into there, when did you start doing the maths and, and start saying to yourself, yeah, this isn't on the up and up? Uh, when we cross the border. Um, so <laughs> Canada, right. We'd go up there sometimes and I, I, I don't know. I, again, ignorant kid. I base everything off my ignorance. You know, us Americans are pretty ignorant people, but we're very outspoken. Uh, and, and so I, I base that off myself and going up there. Um, sometimes you go up there, it's, it's put on like the Blaisdell arena. There's crowds, there's people, it's all legit. And other times you'd go up there and all you have is a, a piece of paper or a CD piece of paper with an address on it. You go there, there's a guy in a trench coat. He hands you another piece of paper with a CD address on it. You go there, meet another guy and you're like three or four stops in before you arrive at an actual venue and then it's like a warehouse place and it's like again this closed door thing invite only so yeah from from first cd guy trench coat guy i mean pretty much going across the border we knew something wasn't right in our you know and so uh we go through the chain of getting there and and you know so they can divert people or however it is we get there it's like this abandoned warehouse type deal we go back we uh, luckily I had uh, I had John Renfro with me, Pat Hawk, uh, Royman Roteberg was fighting as well. Uh, Lonnie Canada out of my camp was fighting. These were all my training partners and stuff. Um, so we were rolling deep. And back then we all were tough cookies. We weren't too afraid of nothing. Ignorant. And uh, so so we get there and not only is it CD there, they did the whole fight card in reverse. Me and Farron were the first fight because they didn't know how many fights they'd get off before the cops busted it. So they start with the main event. They uh, start they smart. started they started with the main event and worked backwards. Okay. And, and I'll tell you what, like in this day and age, I was only able to attend like one event. It wasn't crazy like you're speaking of, but we're we're moving the main event up because we don't know how long we're going to be here. That's yeah. why everybody's here. Yeah. yeah. And then like, and then it went for biggest ticket seller after that all yeah. the way down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> how did an event like this pay? I'm curious. Um. Well, see back then again, like we talked about that earlier, we were freaking happy in the amateurs. If they gave us per diem, like if, if we got 20 Canadian dollars, the freaking, throw in on a and this loonies. is again my they call you, you know, loonies. Yeah, loonies yeah, yeah. and toonies yeah, yeah. you yeah, know yeah. what i mean like and this is my ignorant <laughs> ass i go up there i'm like can i get a canadian bacon and pineapple pizza they're like you mean ham and pineapple i'm like oh canadian bacon you know <laughs> yeah freaking retarded all right so 
they like, have to explain to me, you're in Canada, sir. Okay. All right. I get it now. All right. So, um, we, 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 uh, so the, the, just to get, um, per diem to go up to these fights to pay for your gas. Cause like you said earlier, we were paying to fight. We had to pay for our own travel. We had right. no doctors, no nothing. Uh, you know, you, if you got your ass whooped, hopefully your buddy would drive you home, you know, um, or, or, or fake name <laughs> at the hospital. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, you know I, I luckily never had to go that far. Um, but then, uh, so Farron, what did he pay? And so the way they announced it, and that's what I love about that fight. And I, I, I use that fight a lot because they were announcing it like, oh, these two athletes have been training since they're six years old. Motherfucker. Yep. You know what I mean? I, I, I didn't start until I was like 19. You know what I mean? It's just total lies. They completely build up Farron. Apparently, I was the quote unquote warm up fight for Frank Shamrock, who was one of my coaches huh. at the time. Um, as they were, you know, as, as Maurice was making the alliance or creating the alliance with TK and Frank. So, um, uh, I was the warm up fight. So the, the whole commentary of these guys is phenomenal that it just cracks me up. I, I have such a good time with that. Just such bullshit. But, uh, but that was great. I mean, going out against Farron and, uh, not, you know, being in a seedy little place like that, um, and then whooping his ass. And then uh, that was my first, he gave me my first legit black eye with a big old headbutt. So when I came back with that black eye, Mark Coleman had given one to Maurice, you know, so we were like, oh, we'd always play off that we were twins, you know, because both bald, whatever. Uh, yeah, there is a, a bit skin difference, but we'd play it off. So, um, and then, uh, um, but yeah, so that was phenomenal. And then a couple more fights. Then, then they started working their way down the, the, the chain and my buddy Roman fought his guy for a half hour, which was funny. They were at one point, if you see the whole card, they were clinched. They were just exhausted. The ref separated them. They went to the upper corners and then they both walked out to the middle and just hugged each other again, held on like they were dancing. It was there. They're just, just watching people fight to pure exhaustion was phenomenal. And so you don't get to see that kind of stuff these days. <laughs> So at, at this event, Jason Farron, obviously you win KO knees, um, very loose rules. You know, oftentimes uh, rules are applied to the visiting person, but the yeah. hometown guy kind of gets a little different, uh, a little more leeway in regards to it. But Jason Farron, how what he's kind of, I'm not going to say he's a controversial figure, but he's one of those guys that kind of had that TMA bravado but represented himself as an MMA guy, obviously a UFC veteran as well. Um, how would you describe him? Uh, we were supposed to meet previously at the Blaisdell Arena um, for the uh, Canadian Shoot Fighting Championship. Uh when we got there, the promoter only had one set of four ounce MMA gloves. Uh, we decided that neither one of us would wear gloves. Jason found out I knew a little bit about grappling. I was with Matt Hume back then, uh, or and 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 left in his IROC Z28. So that's how I encapsulate Jason Farron. He he's 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 all show. Uh, he he. I mean, he's a decent athlete. I mean, he's got people that go to his gym and he trains them. But when it comes to the real fight, he don't want any part of that. I had heard a rumor that he challenged you to a fight with glass on your knuckles. Was there any truth to that? That, that okay. So that was backstage at that same thing. Okay. okay. Before or after you beat him up? Oh, no. So this was... This was the first encounter where he left at the Blaisdell Arena because, again, we were backstage and, you know, it was a problem not having two pairs of MMA gloves. And, and then finally Maurice steps up and goes, let's, okay, let's take the gloves off. And then Farron spouted up, I'll fight you with glass on my knuckles. And 20 minutes later, when the fights are happening and then they go to announce us to come out, no one could find Farron. He had left. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I heard about that. 
<laughs> I heard about that. He's Pale an life. interesting guy. He's an interesting guy. Uh, yeah. yeah, I've heard he's passed. I, I don't know him. I can't. I could. I dude. I went on like a Jason Farron deep dive after the whole glass knuckle thing, right. and um, I, I couldn't find much on him. I couldn't find much. I know he's passed away. That's about it. Let's talk about your invite, February seventh, nineteen ninety eight. Oh, I didn't. I didn't know he. I didn't know he passed away. I'm sorry. I, dude, it's very little. Very little on yeah. him. February seventh, nineteen ninety eight. You get invited to Brazil. Sergio Bottarelli is the promoter. International Valley Tudo Championship. You're also in another tournament there. Um, yeah, you're in an eight man eight, tournament. Eight man tournament, and that's where I got to meet uh, meet some of the most. Uh, I mean, Mike Van Erzdo was on that yep. card. Tim Catalfo was on that card. Uh, there's so many uh, uh, phenomenal uh, fighters um, on that card, and uh, so it was an honor to be there. And Sergio treated us all like kings and my trip to brazil really put a lot of things in perspective to me because at the time for a job like i was you know flipping uh uh you know section eight houses and mobile homes and stuff like that for construction and i'd go into these people home and they just ruin them and i'd go over to brazil and you got a family of six living in a cardboard shanty that are happy you know and 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 grateful and good you know versus the american entitlement that's when my my views on the world really started changing. And so we go over there. Sergio puts us up in a phenomenal hotel. One of my favorite things was going down in the morning for breakfast. All you could eat buffet. But the fruit coming out of freaking uh, 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 Brazil. I mean, I felt like really. The Amazon. Like, yeah, yeah, the like, Amazon. Oh. I was yeah. like, the snozberries taste like snozberries. You know, I was just, <laughs> it was so delicious. And uh, uh so man, we just grub, and then that was my first experience with drinking out of a coconut, and all that kind of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Really, I mean, what I think it was one at the time, like one of the fifth largest cities on the planet. You know, what I mean, it's just it's just huge. And and then you go out there and just tons of street kids, and you, you learn so much about the world traveling. And that was my favorite part about MMA and the opportunities it gave me was opening my eyes to the real world and seeing other countries and different stuff but uh so Sergio treated us great we get there we get to the venue it's it's a trip it's in the hotel they've got these weird glass things hanging from the ceiling it just looks like a trip we get out there granted so this is my first uh international valley to do so uh, uh it was awesome uh but no gloves and i'm a striker so uh i didn't realize that there we wear gloves for a reason you hit somebody so many times with your hand your hand now looks like one of those five ounce mma gloves so we go out there no rules the first guy i come across is jesus uh i tell everyone i beat up jesus uh i don't uh jesus something to silva i think and you know i at this point i was i was undefeated in my in my younger career and i was doing really good and this is pre UFC. And wait, wait, just so, wait, just to set the record straight, it's Lucas Silva de, de Jesus. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, uh, and so we scrap it out real quick. Um, great specimen. Again, probably looked like he was a good training partner, but uh, didn't like getting punched. And and once I got him on the ground, and started hitting him. He tapped out pretty quick. So again, going pretty fresh into the second round. Uh, I was feeling pretty good, but going into the second round, my next guy, Dario, uh, Dario Amorim, Dario who would, Amorim, who would just beat up Jason Godsey in the first, which round. absolute savage, Jason right, Godsey. But, yeah. yeah, but I I had no idea, and how his fight went or how fresh he was coming out, but at that point in my life, I had never hit somebody so many times so hard. And not had an effect. And that dude would not go down. I had nothing left. I mean, I think I was like halfway in, 15 minutes in or something. Because that dude kept, I got need in the balls, even with a cup on. I got need in the nuts more in that night than most people do in their entire life. And that's where they introduced me into foot stomping. The thing is with foot stomping. I mean, he was, Dar Dario was a very, very dirty fighter. Um, and that was my first experience with that. Um, 
halfway through the fight, I looked over at Maurice and I'm like, I, I was just feeling sick. I'm like, I'm going to, like, I wanted out. I, I knew I couldn't do anything else. I'm like, I'm going to get sick. He's like, so get sick. Like, Mo, don't let nobody quit. So, <laughs> so I just, I knew, I knew I wasn't getting out of there until I finished him. So we battled it out for all 30 minutes. Um, that was my first big loss, but yet I got more, uh, kudos from more fighters in the fight game for that loss over any of my wins yeah marco who marco who lost later i mean people that i looked up to like hey i saw your fight in brazil good job i mean fighters respect fighting you know not a locker room it's that locker room respect like like you can sit here and look at social media likes and how many thumbs up you get, but that locker room respect, there's no fake in that. There's no fake in that at all. No, nah, no. Nah. Yeah. Joey, when do you first encounter Bob Gilstrap? It was 2001, give or take a year. I'm driving on the 605 freeway, which in California, that's a major freeway. And, uh, this crazy guy pulls up next to me. I'm driving a little truck and starts yelling something about wanting to fight me. And I, I had a girlfriend in the car, so I couldn't look like a punk. I pull off to the side and who jumps out of their car, but the guy that I just watched fight in the IVC, Bob Gilstrap. He had seen my <laughs> tap out sticker and my submission factory sticker, and he was looking for a place to train. I, 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 I never felt so relieved in my life. I was like, oh my God, I, I'm going to get murdered on the side of the road. You know, I, I'm a lifelong wrestler, but I don't want to go fight a UFC vet. No. Uh-uh. But that's how I met him. Haven't, haven't spoke to him since, but that's my memory of meeting Bob. We were, he was looking for a place to train, and I was with Larry Lambus' submission factory at the time. So, so, so Bob, your side of the story was... Joey driving like a total jag off and you had to check him. You had to put me in my place. What happened? What's your side uh, of that story? (laughs) uh, Honestly, I mean, again, like we talked about in the beginning, we, us three have been around forever. And back then they're just, now there's a freaking Gracie Barra or something on every freaking corner down here. So, uh, but you just didn't have gyms, you know? Uh, So that was the whole thing. I was down here and, I needed a spot to train. It was the same thing. Like I'd go out to Vegas and make phone calls to Maurice and, you know, like, Oh, so-and-so has got a gym here. I just show up, you know, do a drop in fee. You're just always looking to fight. I mean, that's you, you, I don't know, staying fresh. I mean, it was exciting back then. You, you wanted that edge. And so, yeah, I was always just looking for a place to go. It was such a small such a small subculture back in the day that yeah if you ran into a guy with a tap out sticker you had a new friend that you yeah because no nobody else could talk to you about the subject you know no no yeah it was it was a hush subject you know what i mean and and back you you'd have to explain it to people like we said in the beginning and and, you know then people look at y'all you mean like human cockfighting no we're like we're both uh competitors we're both trained for this this is our choice you know this is but people had no idea. So it was a very small subculture. And then uh, being at parties or being around family, you always run into the guy, Joe, you'd know this, that, oh, I've got a sister's cousin's brother who knows this guy whose dog shits in his yard. He can kill you with two, two punches. Two fingers. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, or this, the I've got touch. this guy, you know, oh, my cousin, he's in that. And I'm like, but back then I'm like, okay, what's his name? They'd say, I'm like, no, he's not. You yeah, because if I don't if I don't fucking know him, he ain't nobody. <laughs> like, there's only a few of us. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I mean everybody knew each other, and it was like, so he's from our area, and I don't know his name, and he's doing this, even right. though yeah. I'm at these events every weekend. Is that what you're telling me? Okay. Yeah. 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 It's one of those situations. So UFC 17, obviously, you make your UFC debut May 15th, 1998. How do you get the call? Um, is this John Pretty or is it uh, Art Davies still? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, okay. I want to say Art, um, but I think so, it, I don't, and John was like kind of hanging around, right buzzing around, there, but I yeah, think it was still Art. Yeah. It's like I, I remember meeting Joe Rogan backstage at the Hawaiian Super Brawl before, you know, he was even part of the UFC. So, like, we were all of us, we were there when it started. 
so that's what's what's really cool about uh being a pioneer of the fastest growing the biggest you know sport and all that kind of stuff but um so the reason maurice and amc split was due to management issues my manager at the time uh kurt he took the call i didn't even know i was just told hey you've got x amount of time you're gonna go fight in the usc um the problem with that at this point they're like we got you in but there was only two weight classes back then 200 and down and 200 and up well like i said earlier my body i'd been 220 pounds since the fifth grade so i had to get me to cut weight so two weeks out of the ufc i'm at 198 pounds uh i'm lean i'm riding my bike i roll my mountain bike dislocate my shoulder uh for two weeks i can do nothing but stationary bike i can't even grapple i can't do nothing uh maurice tells me goes hey look you can't you can't pull out this ufc he goes you pull out they're not calling back so um i got to went with maurice we flew to mobile alabama for ufc 17 uh Right when we got off the plane, I, I had a sauna suit on since 4 a.m. that morning. Um, I was talking, taking water retention pills. We went and hit any, every cardio machine, played basketball, swam, did everything we could. And I lost 14 pounds in a day to make weight for the UFC uh, and then fought the next day and, and uh, did not do well at all. Well, Carlos so, Newton is your opponent. Um, how was your interaction with Carlos? Um, Carlos came off as very arrogant and I, I, the, uh, to me with all the fights that I'd done and the behind the scenes and the backstage and the after parties, I always kind of, uh, I was more of a partier than say Maurice, but I, I liked the way the winners held themselves a certain way and were respectful to the, their opponents. And Carlos did not come off of a person that way. I was, I was always kind to my guys. I'd buy some beers. I'd, you know, Hey, let's talk this and that. Uh, Carlos came off as a very push off kind of way. Um, and so he was the only guy I, I wish I could have fought again uh, at a hundred percent, you know? So, and, and again, with the MMA and the fight and you're supposed to keep your emotions out of it. But I got hey, Bob, 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 let me ask you: Was he a dick? Yes or no? Yeah, he is a prick. <laughs> okay, so yeah. I, I'm not going to pile on, but I will say he refuses to respond to our interview requests. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Well, he. That's yeah, all I'm he I, I'll tell you this: I heard he I'm got saying. stabbed. He got stabbed up in Canada for breaking up a fight. I'm like, serve you right, you prick. <laughs> but this whatever. is Bob. It's Bob Gilstrap, is- everybody. <laughs> <laughs> An incredibly stacked card, by the way. It's uh, Frank Shamrock and Jeremy Horn, Mark Coleman and Pete Williams, Tank, Hugo Dorte, Van Arsdale. I mean, this is a very stacked event. The, the guys I, I had the opportunity to, to, to uh, compete with and our era were, were some of the legendary guys. I mean, it was great. Like uh, Cream of the so crop. The, cream, cream of the, of the crap, crop to get 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. And 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 uh, so no the faking that, it. There was no, no faking it. Th- these Mm-mm. were real dudes. There was no smack talk on the internet. There was no, no. bullshit. Everyone was cool. And so, uh, like, even cutting weight for that, um, the last couple pounds, I was fatigued. Mo's like, "All right, you're into the sauna or the steam room." Sends me in there, uh, and Mark Coleman. Uh, I, 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 well, I go in there for a while. I pop out. It's Maurice. I go in there for a while, pop out, check my weight, that kind of stuff. He'd put me back in there. Then I pop out one time and there's Mark Coleman, Mark, all these guys are sitting on the bench with Maurice, just chatting it up, waiting for me to make weight, you know? And, and it's like, that's cool as shit. You know what I mean? That, that was, it was almost like I wanted to stop and, and take a picture or, you know, take, take all that in or get some autographs of, of other guys that I hadn't met yet, but Maurice had and, and, but yet here I'm trying to cut weight and I keep coming out and I'm bitching like a little girl, man. I'm like, man, this thing is so hot. I'm like, there's, there's something wrong. I, I can't breathe. And Mo's like, I don't want to hear it. You got two more pounds or I don't want to hear yeah, it. That's a wrong crew to look for sympathy with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I want, and of course, Mo, 
you know, and I'm coming out and all these guys, these, these big old men, and I'm just, I'm all sucked up and just whining. I can't, it's too hot. And then, <laughs> you know, and then he just keeps pushing me back in there. And then when I finally make weight, I come out and I just lay down on the cold tile floor and, and they're all laughing at me and sure as shit right then here comes the maintenance guy with his bucket of tools goes, you weren't just in you in there, were you? That thing's broken. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I had no, I'm like, and then they all just erupt in laughter and take, yeah. you know, no pity, no pity. No, funny, just, like, funny. Ah! Great joke. Yeah. Great yeah. joke. Oh, yeah. First yeah. covered first degree burns, you know, head to toe. Oh, that's so. funny. That's funny. Um, you w- make your way back up to Canada for Western Canada's toughest March 18, 2000. Gary Ant- arm burst. Here's the thing about the golden boy. He's got an extensive boxing background. He's got phenomenal submissions. Ends his career at 6-0. and oh. Like There's like out of the old school cats, cats, he's on my short list of why didn't he make it to the UFC. Right. Um, yeah, I lost that one by decision. Uh, the, um, you, you got a hell of a chin because that guy can, that guy can crack. Yeah. He, he, uh, it was, that was a good fight. I mean, I, I, I wasn't happy with the, you know, the call at the end, but, uh, we did do some exchanging and stuff like that. Um, so I was just, yeah, I wasn't happy off, uh, you know, coming off that UFC loss and all that kind of stuff as well. So, you mentioned Frank Shamrock. Um, what would, do you have any Frank Shamrock stories, or or what was it like being in the gym with them? Frank Frank uh, was more close with Maurice, of course, and then my other buddy John Renfro. So again, uh, uh, Frank. We had that more uh, teacher student relationship versus buddies. Um, and he pushed, but the thing is, having the chance to train between both Frank and Ken Shamrock, I didn't, Ken to me is just like a toothless silverback gorilla. He's one of the strongest guys. He just manhandles you. And the first guy that chokes us all out uh, with a triangle choke. Um, and, but Frank, I liked his fluidity his his different fighting styles so i tried to be more like frank and so i just didn't have you know that that greek bod that frank's got the greek bod yeah tk kosaka how was his english i'm not bad not not the worst i mean it was a bit broken uh tk you know back then taught us the what we called the tk guard for the Alliance, which, you know, you transitions over to uh, jujitsu as the butterfly guard. Um, it was a phenomenal uh, intro to our game. TK, man, TK was a phenomenally class act. He was always polite, always a strong training partner. Uh, probably one of the biggest Japanese dudes I've ever met. Uh, 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 he got an offer. Remember that show, that American Gladiators show? I guess he yeah. got an offer. He got an offer to be on that show and turned it down. Um, and then later, when uh, when I got to go fight in Japan, uh, TK was uh, one of the guys running the the, uh, the fight gyms over there. Over there, the, all the fighters live with you. They cook. I mean, everything's everything's in the house. So, yeah, I just love TK. He's such a good person. All right. So TK, Frank Shamrock leaves Lions Den. They form, he goes out with Maury Smith. They form the alliance. TK goes with him. Jerry Bolander, Pete Williams stay at the Lions Den. But TK and Frank at one point were absolutely, I mean, obviously Frank, but TK was also in the Lions Den. TK's UFC fight was against Pete Williams. Was that like an intentional setup between Frank and Ken to put their students against each other? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, cause again, I was, I was like the, if, if they were the, you know, the starting lineup, I was the B string, you know, I was, I was the up and comer. I was the training partner. So all the logistical stuff wasn't even handled. I mean, I was so ignorant. Uh, my first contract I signed was for 33%. I didn't realize coach standards were 15%, you know, um, or 10%. 
Uh, I, I locked into a 10 year gr- uh, deal at, at 33 and a third. Uh, with who? I, I had, with who? With Kirk. You know, that, that was, I, I, yeah. Kirk, the, the, Kirk, Kirk who? Jensen was my, Kirk. was my, yeah, he was my uh, uh, manager. But the thing is, he was more. Wait, 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 wait. Kirik Jens, Jensen or Kirk Jensen? Kirk Jensen. Okay, okay, go ahead. Yeah. And uh, he was Maurice's uh, manager as well, and as well as uh, Bambi. She was a female fighter and a couple of – but Kirk pretty much spent his time – Kirk hated for the most part. Uh, I was uh, I was the – I don't know, the, the black sheep of the group, you know, out partying, kicking it up, didn't watch my mouth or whatever, and Kirk had his own agenda, and I was lucky – that I even got the fights that I did. It's not like he made phone calls for me or anything, to my knowledge. I mean, people <laughs> people call people called called looking specifically for me because of word of mouth or found out about me. Um, yeah, I, I I made the worst. Again, I was an ignorant little redneck coming out of the country. I didn't know. I just wanted to, I just wanted to beat people up. And I was just training there one day, and they're like, "Hey, you're doing pretty good through the amateurs. You keep doing what you're doing. We're gonna pay you." And I was like, "All right." So I signed anything anybody put. In front of me, I don't know. Right. What's going to end with this one? Jeff Monson, AMC Return of the Gladiators, July 29th, ninth, two thousand. Jeff, um, did he look enhanced standing <laughs> across the room? <laughs> just, uh, just out of curiosity. Uh, either that, or uh, he had just gotten a fight with a, a whole hornet's nest, and those were a bunch of stings because he was swelled. Um, he, uh, yeah, that, that guy is uh, so enhanced, so big, so strong, shorter than me, but in his af- I, I mean, I give credit to anybody's athleticism. That guy had an ankle pick further away than any other person. I normally I can get a knee or an uppercut. I can get some sort of strike on a, on a wrestler. I, I had nothing on fucking Jeff. Jeff was he was under my knee by the time he was within striking distance. He's able to like ride the ground at such a low level for it, an incredible distance. Yes. It's so it's, it's fucking amazing. Yes. It was amazing. I and agree with that. He hit me with it all night long. I, I, I didn't get one shot off on him, and he just hold my legs. Uh, and I just kept teeing off on the, on the top of or side of his head. He, you know, he kept trying to hide his head. So I'd have to hit the top. Then I have to switch to the other arm. Because that was a thing back then uh, to eliminate the striker. You know, you had the, the or the submission. You had the uh, you could grab the ring back in the day. Well, after a while, hitting the back of the head was illegal. So as soon as you hit somebody, they just turn their head so you'd be hit in the back, and then they turn to the other side. You know, so uh, but and the whole time I'm hitting him, I I was talking to him, let me up, Jeffrey, and he'd look up at me and grin and smile and <laughs> and hide his head again. You know. And, and then, then the ref would stand us up, and I'd try something. That guy'd be on the carpet, and I'd be on my back, you know. And I'd let me up, Jeffrey, you know. And he'd smile, and so I just went on like that until it was over, and he got the uh, got the W. So uh, great. At one, at one point in this fight, he's on top of you. The ref breaks it up, and they let him go back to his corner. It looked like they either had an issue with his glove, or they were letting him. Uh, relocated, dislocated finger. Do you have any memory of that? I I don't remember. I couldn't see what they were doing. I was probably gasping for air my it, own self, you know? It, it, it looked like they let him re, uh, realign a dislocated finger, which, you know, if I were you, I'd be mad about. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, and that's just, I mean, if you, well, and you, Joey, you watched my fights up in Canada against Farron as well. Like, I don't know yeah. why it, it would, why all the guys I fight get breaks in the corner and shit. Like, in the fair fight, yeah. I had to go, go get him, you know? Uh, uh, Bob, if you were to break bad on Jeff, he's a, now a Russian citizen. He's not coming back to this country. I mean, by no. all means, you can say whatever it is you want with no repercussion. Uh, now, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff uh, again, he came from around the same area. Uh, like, me and Hallman went to the same high school. Uh, uh, Jeff was from Olympia. Uh, I talked to Jeff. Jeff used to like, what do you do for fun? I like, what's an anarchist do? Like, you know, I didn't fucking know. Like, what do you, <laughs> yeah, what do you yeah. do? You know, like what, what's, what's steroids? Oh, we, 
yeah, yeah we hang yeah, out right? at Starbucks, you know. You know it's like, oh, we, we go down to the Capitol and spray paint shit. I'm like, wow, big man. You know what I mean? Like, hey, is that, that making a difference? Uh, so, so like, we get these talks. Jeff got a little crazy there for after a while and then and then took off. Uh, 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 well, I ran into him again uh, in a fight in Washington State when I was traveling through. And uh, I went back into his corner and he was laying down. And uh, I pulled him up and gave him a hug and said, hey, good to see you. But he went out. I guess he was on the Russian circuit at that point. He was fighting every week. The guy just fought himself into the ground. He actually fought like six years with one eye in our – there's here, there's a couple things here. So our Jeff Monson interview is absolutely crazy. Like uh, – I, I, I would have approached it a little different now because our formula is a little different now than it was then, but it was just kind of us kind of getting this together. Um, he fought for multiple years with one eye. His relationship, wow. you had mentioned Dennis Hallman going to high school with Dennis. What was that like? Dennis, uh, Dennis was a cocky little kid, had a really cute older sister that was in my grade. Uh, ran into Hallman once in the locker room playing football. I think I was a junior. He was a freshman talking shit, and I had to punch him then. Uh, but he he was just always – I mean, he was always a phenomenal wrestler. I mean, he had a reason to be confident. But, uh, you know, let, 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 I, I draw the line at Eric. You know what I mean? When, when you're – if you need to put people down to make yourself feel better, I got a fucking problem with you. You know that that that's all there is to it, and he was one of those kind of people. Well, we're he talking went, high school. Yeah, we're talking high school. But he and Jeff Monson, had he, it's a relationship where we got Dennis Hallman on, and the majority of our interview is confirming the stories that we had gathered in previous interviews. And Dennis essentially is going, "Yep, that happened. Yep, that happened." <laughs> are, are you aware of him and Jeff Monson's relationship? Uh, I know. I, I I just heard rumors. I heard rumors. How crazy it was! Uh, yeah, yeah, just I mean, fighting at parties, fighting everywhere. Everyone's fighting. Just yeah, yeah. Moving furniture up on his roof, including his cat, stuff like oh, that. I, I didn't hear any of that. Yeah. Oh, dude, dude. All right, Frank Shamrock. When he came over from you know to form the alliance. All right, if I'm going to recommend one interview for like the old school cats it's tony galindo like the lion's den tell all right. did frank ever come back with like yeah then ken got ripped off by this gay porn star for about 30 grand in ecstasy and then you know he beat up Pete williams and you know did they ever talk about stuff like that or tony no, and I, uh vernon white outside of a bar because he's thunder no, banging I, his wife anything like that they, if if he did it it wasn't to me I, you know, okay. like I said, he, yeah, he okay. was more with, uh, Maurice and John. Uh, we didn't, me and Frank were not that tight. Damn. Yeah. Sorry. I got a good <laughs> one about, uh, UFC 17 though. So here's, uh, have it. so th have this it. was, uh, this boss is, Rutten? uh, boss route. And so boss is there. So is tank Abbott boss. I fucking love boss. And then, um, so, uh, this is after. Is this pre or after Maurice had beat Tank? I'm pretty sure it was after. So Tank was a little bit more humble. And Tank uh, went up in the elevator earlier that day with me and Maurice. And one-on-one, -on -one, that dude was a half bad guy. He was a nice guy. He wasn't this shit-talking guy that everyone told, you know, talk, told about. After the USC, I don't see him again. After the USC transpires, I'm out there. I'm hanging with Art Davey or, you know, all these guys and, and uh, uh, Boss Rutten and all these guys. And, of course, Maurice doesn't go out and drink, but so I'm out with these guys and uh, having a good time and me and, you know, whatever. And I walk across the, the dance floor to to go get another beer and, and uh, Tank's out with all of his cronies right there and Tank's got to act tough in front of all of his guys. So I, I go walking by, he grabs me, and this is before I, I knew that, well, I don't know for true, but I heard he was gay. I don't, I don't fucking know. I don't know anything, you know, as people were studying that shit. But anyway, Tank grabs me by the hips and kind of does the show dominance thing like he's riding me from behind. I kind of, oh, I, I break away. I'm like, ha ha, you know, whatever. I go walk and I grab my beer. 
and then go back to the you know our group or whatever. At least he could do is buy the beer. I mean, right, you know, right, yeah. right, right. After that. <clears throat> so then, then a little bit later, uh, Tank goes walking by, and I grab Tank and I pull him into me, and I fuck it, I give him the little, ah, 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 you know, and his cronies don't like that. And Tank kind of smiles and giggles, right, and got a sheepish grin. But then all his boys come up and like, you ain't gonna let him get away with this shit. You ain't, you know. And so they're pushing us to fight. So here I'm in this dance club bar thing uh and at this point boss rootin had left uh and and went so and so i i didn't have anybody but promoters with me no fighters and uh tank's about to to take flight on me and and one-on-one with tank i'm like okay i i'll be able to do this but like i can't fight this whole group of people then all of a sudden i feel this hand on my shoulder and this beautiful bald head pops out of nowhere (laughs) he's been gone gone for about an hour and he's got his his dutch accent he's like all right tank we're gonna do this shit or what you know and boss rootin's got my back and all of his cronies kind of just took off after that and fact boss saved my life once again so there was a good one with boss <laughs> we had a good night that night boss uh and known for his partying yeah mm-hmm. yeah wow so maurice smith when was the last time you talked to him uh i i usually we talk usually around his birthday every year if i don't talk to him about two or three times a year i still we've been, we've been trying to get him on forever man well, and like, why he won't, he won't even he i'm like he won't even go on the the, the podcast that i uh, uh co-host sometimes on weekends you know and talk on and just as an interview he he won't do nothing unless he gets paid he, really he, yeah he's fine for me yeah, do you find I'm like, do you find paid? I don't know. I don't. Okay. Uh, he, yeah, I I don't know. I never I never asked it. He's like, Bob, I ain't doing nothing. I get paid. I'm like, he wouldn't even. When I had my gym out in Colorado for five years, I kept like, hey, come out here. This would be great. Nah. <laughs> he's like, he'd send me a, a like, oh, you, I'll do it for this amount. Like, I ain't paying you to come out. <laughs> wow. So. <laughs> Yeah. All those he, he, all those punches you took from him that should be worth something. Yeah, something, some some sort of little uh, 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 gratuity, you know. Well, here, let's plug your podcast. What podcast do you do you occasionally host on the weekends? Um, it's called Fighting Words. It's uh, it's on. Uh, I to be honest with you guys, like I don't even know how to get on a podcast. I just started looking, you know, looking you guys up, and this the other one. I I'm an Android user, not an iPhone guy. Uh, uh, so I, I'm not a huge podcast guy and I, you know, I tell people about it and I rarely can even find it myself, but Say it uh, again. It's, mo- it's, it's fight. What? Fighting. So it, it doesn't have the G Okay. fighting, fighting. F- fighting words. And it's on, uh, fighting words, Go- podcast, Google play, Apple, iTunes, all that stuff. Yeah. Huh? It's on one of those things. Okay. Um, and then, uh, it's more <laughs> of a boxing podcast. Again, I was kind of like the way, uh, I, I met Joey is, is I was at a bar in DC five, six years ago, ear hustling a conversation. Cause they were talking about boxing and, uh, and I'm like, Hey, I, of course I spout up, you know, and jump into some people. I don't even know. Hey, I start talking MMA and, and this and that. And they're like, Oh, Hey, we know this guy, we do a soccer podcast, but the guy that does it, he does an MMA podcast. Would you go on as a guest star and I was, or a guest speaker. And that was six years ago. Or that, no, five, five. It was right after the Jorge Masvidal Ben Askren fight, uh, where he took that knee, um, and uh, you know they brought me on, and I was like, well, you gotta, you know, I explained who they both were, and then you know uh, Ben talking shit coming over from his uh, other organization, and I, well, you know, he Ben Askren for it, so, and then they just keep, they just keep calling, they won't stop calling. Okay, <laughs> yeah. fair enough, fair enough. Bob Gilstrap, brother, although you met Joey on the side of the road, uh, <laughs> you know, about about two decades ago, Joey's been mentioning you in regards to uh, putting you on a podcast. We looked at your record a few times, and then our buddy Hong Kong Fui from the underground forum, MixedMartialArts.com. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to interact with, like, if you're here at this time right now, you're you're like a mentally ill fight fan. I highly recommend you guys sign up for the underground forum, mixedmartialarts.com. It is just a group of people just like us, awesome. you know, where we all gather. So, Bob, 
I sincerely, sincerely appreciate your time. And uh, we'll be sending you a YouTube link so you can send All this right. to your friends once we get it up. All right, hey, buddy? guys, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys, and I appreciate what you do. Yeah, Thank so you, Bob. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Take care. God bless. Joey. Another one in the record books. Yeah, you've been talking about him for over a year. I didn't realize I've been talking about him that much, but I'm glad I finally locked him down. You yeah, know, you that scare to, that yeah. scary encounter finally paid off. <laughs> you know what I mean? But th think about like your headspace. You're gonna get out of the car on a highway. <laughs> well, like I said, okay, so I got a girlfriend sitting next to me who hears me talk about MMA and I'm training MMA all the time and I'm gonna bitch <laughs> out. No, I, I can't have my punk car card pulled. So yeah, I could follow him to the side of the road, and I was very grateful that he just wanted to train with me. Dude. It's a good way to get shot, actually. And by the way, I mean, in this scenario, I am 22 years old and I'm an idiot. So would I do that today? Probably not. You know what? It's just like you got to look at her and you say, babe, today I woke up and chose violence. We're yeah. pulling over. <laughs> We're pulling over. We're going to see what this is all about. Yeah. 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 No, it was cool, man. I'm glad he came on. You know, um, he's he's still sharp. You know, he had a hell of a career, fought some big names, and, you know, I'm glad we knocked this one out. 100%. So, ladies and gentlemen, like, share, subscribe. You guys got to do that. We had a, uh, a really good uh, 2023. We grew by 70%. You know, we're currently looking for somebody to help head up, a, like, a producer for us. We definitely need some help. Um, booking guests, clips, thumbnails, stuff like that. Otherwise, I mean, Joey, it's just me – and you and Andrew, there's a guy named Anthony Shears. He uh, doesn't do much, but Andrew Mendoza. He's part, of the, he's part of the group, allegedly. I, I keep hearing about him. Yeah, yeah. So if you guys want to come join, come over and help us. Just figure out what it is you can do. Um, this is a passion project. Um, I, I know, Joey, in the next couple of months, I'm going to be heading out to California. I'm expecting to take a few lefts and rights from your wife in regards to this. <laughs> I told her if we stay the course, this is going to make us dozens of dollars. Yes, dozens. Right, 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 right. So please like, share, subscribe. We can't do this without you. MixedMartialArts.com is also a phenomenal gathering place if you're into stuff like this. So, Joey, I'll see you in a couple months. And I think we got Herb Dean right around the corner. Anybody else? He'll be, he'll, he'll be coming on. That's the only one I got right now. Um, the Punisher. Said he would do it this winter, and it is winter. Jason. Oh, the uh, Alessio? No, no, no. no. He's, got a, he's, he's, got a, he's got a knockout win over Babalu. Oh, Jason. Oh, oh, Canadian cat, right? You're talking about the Canadian guy? And, and a loss to Marco Huas. And his name is escaping me at the moment, which I hope he doesn't see this clip because. Yeah, Jeff Coran. I also got Jeff Coran. He's going to be really good for some, some fantastic stories. Um, Jeff Cram, I think we're going to record him beginning of next week. I got to get a hold of Lytle. Um, he's going to sit in on that one. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Like the, the, wrist, the list is kind of getting short right now. We got to start making fun. Luigi Fiorante, I got him Ooh. lined up. That's a good guy out of California. Raphael Italians Torrey. are always a good guest. Raphael a lot Torrey, of character charisma. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Raphael Torrey, training partner. Gerald Strevent, training partner as well. So he's going to have a little insight into that. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm either gonna, I, I gotta hook up with Mike Brown at the end of the month over at American Top Team, hoping you know I can kind of cherry pick some of the guys from over there as well. So we're gonna get it, we're gonna get it going. So, ladies and gentlemen, you got friends or family that uh might be good guests here, hit us on our inbox through Instagram. That's the best way to get a hold of us, Joey. Until next time, I'll talk brother. to you in about an hour. Bye, yeah, be good. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.